So in the last video, we saw the SuperDense coding protocol. In the first part of that protocol, one of the participants, Eve, prepared a quantum state of two qubits using the following circuit. It is, of course, a two qubit circuit with inputs zero and zero. And uh, the first thing done to the first qubit is to apply a Hadamard gate. And then a controlled NOT gate is applied between the two uh, qubits. And the output, as we saw last time, uh, is just the 0, 0, plus 1, 1 uh, state all over root 2, also often known as uh, the Bell state. And uh, after preparing those two qubits, Eve sends the first of them off to Alice and the second off uh, to Bob. And really, from the point of view of the superdense coding protocol, all that matters is that she had some way of preparing that state. It doesn't actually matter what the details of this uh, circuit are. And so while it's nice to have this detailed quantum circuit, um, in fact, it doesn't matter to the protocol uh, exactly uh, what the details are. And in fact, a quantum computing expert could have skipped uh, the circuit entirely and just said, Eve prepares the Bell state in her lab, then sends you know, the qubits off to the respective uh, uh, other participants. And the reason they could have said that is that the expert knows, even without seeing, that it's possible to find a circuit preparing the Bell state, or indeed any other uh, two qubit uh, state. And that's very helpful since it lets them not worry so much about the details of uh, the circuit. Uh, you know, it's nice just to be able to say, prepare this state and not to have to worry about this from, from the point of view of coming up with protocols and, and understanding them. Uh, but how do they know that such a circuit exists? Well, uh, what we're gonna discuss in this video is a result that shows that for any two normalized uh, states, um, there's always possible to find a unitary uh, connecting them. So let me just state that a little bit more uh, formally. Uh, in particular, well, we'll give them uh, names. Uh, so for any uh, normalized states, psi and phi, there always exists um, a unitary, uh, uh, which we'll call U, uh, such that U acting on phi, oh, excuse me, uh, U acting on psi gives us phi as the output. In fact, this result holds in any vector space. Uh, we've been concentrating on qubits and many qubit systems, which are you know, particular uh, vector spaces, but the result holds in any vector space. And the relevance to Eve and superdense coding uh, is uh, that you know, if you start with the zero, zero state, uh, it guarantees that there exists a unitary which produces the Bell state um, as output. And we know uh, by universality uh, that it's possible to build you up out of single qubit gates uh, and C naught. So this particular U, uh, you know, we're absolutely guaranteed can be built up in that way. Actually figuring the circuit out is a detail uh, that might take uh, some work, but we're assured uh, that it's certainly possible to do that uh, and possible for Eve therefore to create the Bell state. So you know, we can leave that sort of to a later, a later time. Now why exactly is uh, the result uh, true. Well, what we're going to do, uh, you know, kind of the, the key difficulty in proving the result is that it's not enough to know how a matrix acts just on a single state psi, uh, you know, producing an output phi. We need to know how it acts on everything else, and, you know, all the other parts of the vector space as well, if we're to guarantee that it's unitary. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by introducing a basis, in fact, an orthonormal basis for the vector space. Um, and we're going to define an action, one of whose elements is psi, and we're going to define a matrix uh, whose action is defined on all of those uh, basis elements. So in particular, uh, we're going to make uh, psi uh, the first uh, vector in an orthonormal set actually have an orthonormal basis uh, for the whole uh, uh, vector space. So in particular, 
So psi1 is equal to psi, then we have a vector psi2 which is also normalized and is orthogonal to psi1, a third vector psi3 which is normalized and orthogonal to the other two, uh, and so on. Um, and you know, it's very convenient to be able to define u in these terms. We're going to define its action on all the different psi j's, uh, essentially. Uh, and it'll, you know, that lets us specify what its action on psi is, because the, the first one is uh, uh, psi one is, is equal to psi. Uh, but we can ensure that sort of globally it has a, a unitary action. Now you might wonder why it's possible to find such an orthonormal basis for the vector space. Uh, and that's a detail I, I actually won't get into. Uh, if you're familiar uh, with the Gram-Schmidt procedure, uh, one of the most elementary procedures in linear algebra, you'll know uh, that it's always possible to construct an orthonormal basis uh, in this way. So I'll just assume that you have that as background. So uh, we'll also do something very similar uh, for phi. Um, you know, we're going to define an orthonormal basis whose first element is just phi, and then they have these other elements, phi 2, etc., all of which are normalized and orthogonal uh, to each other. So the definition uh, for our U, our construction of this uh, matrix, uh, is just going to be the sum on J, the column vector uh, uh, phi J times the row vector psi j. So there's a column vector times a row vector which is just a square uh, matrix. So you know, this is a square matrix and we're going to have to check that u has the properties. It has to be unitary and it has to have uh, this property that the action on psi is equal to phi. So let's start with that, that first thing. I'm running out of space here so I'll just do it uh, over in this little part of the, of the uh, screen. u acting on psi um, is of course uh, just u acting on psi1 by definition of psi1 and uh, well what, what happens when we take the action of u on psi1? Well let's look at the action of each of these individual matrices on psi1. Um, for the, the first term, the j equals 1 term, uh, this you know the product of this row vector with the column vector psi1 with psi1 because it's a normalized state, that's just equal to 1. So we pick up a phi 1 uh, uh, term. But for all the other terms, so psi 2, for example, well, because psi 2 is orthogonal to psi 1, the, the second term just vanishes. It's, it's 0. So the only term which survives is the j equals 1 term. So we get phi 1. And that, of course, is by definition equal to phi. So it has the right action on the state psi. Now, the other thing that we need to show is that it's unitary. So we need to analyze or to understand uh, what the product of u dagger uh, with u is. So we'll just plug in the definition. So we're going to have a double sum now. Let's sum over j and k, for example. Um, to compute the u dagger, well, we need to take the dagger operation on, on this product. And uh, we've seen earlier that that just uh, interchanges uh, the order uh, of the two. So we end up with uh, psi j phi j and then times um, phi k psi k and so uh, you know, a way of doing this a matrix multiplication we just look this is a number here it's the product of a row vector with a column vector um, and because of the orthonormality of the phi uh, uh, k uh, vectors um, this is guaranteed to be equal to 1 when j is equal to k and otherwise equal to 0. So the only terms which survive are the terms where j is equal to k. So this is equal to uh, the sum on j, psi j, psi j. Okay, um, now, <laughs> so we, we've shown that u dagger u is equal to uh, this uh, sum here. And in fact, it's a general result, which is useful in its own right, and we'll prove uh, on the next uh, slide that for any orthonormal set, psi j, this uh, sum is always equal to the identity operation. So I'm just going to take advantage of that. We'll prove it in a minute. Uh, but you know, once we've got that uh, result, uh, it, it, it completes the proof that u is a unitary operation. And as a result, it completes the proof 
uh, of this uh, result. So how do we prove uh, that result? Uh, I should mention, uh, by the way, uh, you know, it's called often uh, the completeness uh, relation. It says that if you have an orthonormal basis um, for your vector space, then this sum is always equal to the identity operation. And that's quite a useful uh, uh, result to have. Uh, it's worth verifying, actually. You can, you can do some examples if you use uh, as your orthonormal basis uh, just uh, the standard uh, unit vectors, you know, with one at the top, zero everywhere, or just a single one somewhere, uh, you can easily verify uh, uh, this result. Uh, we're not going to need to worry. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to go through and do that explicitly, but it's worth thinking about. All right, so why is the completeness relation true? Uh, actually, the proof is trivial. What we do is we, you know, we, we're going to analyze this matrix, and we want to see what its action is on let's say, a particular element in this orthonormal basis. Let's call it psi k. Well, if we consider its action on psi k, we, we see that, in fact, uh, you know, all... So, so you know, this, this product between... Uh, matrix product between uh, this row vector psi j and psi k vanishes because of the orthonormality unless j is equal to k, in which case it's equal to 1 by the normalization condition, uh, and therefore we just get... A single term coming out, which is psi k. So what, what have we learned from this little analysis? We've learned that this matrix, whatever it is, acting on psi k just gives us psi k back. In other words, it, it has the identity action uh, on the uh, psi k states. But, but the psi k formed a, a basis for the whole vector space. And so it doesn't matter. You know, we can expand any uh, vector at all as a linear combination of the psi k's, and we'd see that we'd, uh, if we let this operate, uh, this matrix act on uh, the linear combination, we just get the same linear combination back. Therefore, uh, this has the identity action on every single vector in the vector space, and must be, in fact, the identity uh, uh, matrix. So that's all that's required to prove uh, the completeness, the relation. And and you know, if we put put all those facts uh, together, what we've learned is that for any two quantum states, there's always a unitary uh, matrix which uh, relates the two of them, and that's why we can be guaranteed that there's a circuit uh, Eve can use to prepare her bell state even without knowing the details of what that circuit is. I should say, uh, by the way, that for systems uh, containing very large numbers of qubits, hundreds, thousands of qubits, um, or in particular for quantum states with thousands of qubits, the circuit needed to prepare a very complex state uh, might be very, very large uh, indeed. Uh, but for two qubit systems, uh, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, you can always do it with just a few uh, gates. Okay, so that completes uh, this uh, video. Uh, in the next video, we're going to come back uh, to this concept of an entangled uh, state uh, and ask ourselves, well, what exactly is an entangled state uh, anyway, uh, and what makes them so special uh, and useful in uh, quantum information processing?